Hello, we are Karen Deppa and Mike Donahue of Pilot Light Resilience Resources. Welcome to our presentation, Resilient Skills Training, Behavioral Health Primary Prevention for First Responders. We truly wish we could give this presentation in person at the Maryland State Firemen's Association Convention, but we're very grateful to the association for giving us the opportunity to do this online. Thank you for taking the time to view our presentation we hope and expect that you'll come away with a few ideas you can apply in your emergency service life and your everyday life. In this presentation, we want to give you a very brief overview of what resilience training can look like and what it can achieve. We're going to start by talking about why resilient skills are necessary for the emergency response community. We'll then address what resilience is, the different ways that it's expressed, what the research says about learning resilience skills, and some results that have been achieved by resilience training done in the military. We'll talk about where resilience training fits in the continuum of prevention measures for behavioral health. And then we'll launch into the three pillars of resilience that research shows are most important to the emergency response community. As we talk about each pillar, we'll share suggestions and demonstrate some skills for you to practice that are useful at any time, but especially as you're dealing with the additional stresses and demands brought on by the pandemic, current civil unrest, and whatever else you may be facing during this unsettled time. We will wrap up briefly by talking about how to apply these skills both on the job and at home. Before we get started, here's a little bit about who we are. As I mentioned, I'm Karen Deppa. My dad was a volunteer firefighter in New Jersey who suffered from depression for most of his adult life. And I felt really helpless to do anything to ease his pain and suffering. Meanwhile, throughout my career, I worked with firefighters on the national, state, and local levels, primarily on fire prevention advocacy with the National Association of State Fire Marshals. In 2015, I got my master's degree in applied positive psychology at the University of Pennsylvania, where I brought my desire to help address behavioral health issues together with my love and respect for the fire rescue services whom I'd spent my career working with. Now, an expanded version of my master's thesis has been published as a Springer Briefs and Fire ebook called Resilience Training for Firefighters, an approach to prevent behavioral health problems. Mike and I set up Pilot Light Resilience Resources to work on sharing the science and skills of resilience with the emergency response community. Mike, over to you. Thanks, Karen. Uh, I come from a family of firefighters with my dad, my brother, my brother-in-law all being involved from a very early age. Um, for myself, I started as a volunteer in Prince George's County when I was 16 years old. When I was 20, I was subsequently hired by Montgomery County Fire and Rescue, where I served for 35 years and retired as an assistant chief. I spent the last 10 years of my career responsible for the fire marshal's office, where I developed a strong appreciation for prevention, kind of like putting the toothpaste back in the tube. During my time in the fire service, I have been a lifelong student culminating in a PhD in fire and emergency management. I guess the obvious question is how did I get here? I became interested in the psychological impact on firefighters after having two good friends cycle through my office before retiring with debilitating psychological injuries. I met Karen through work and it became quite easy after that for her to convince me to play a part in helping prevent such injuries in the future. All right, it's pretty obvious that firefighters have one of the most stressful jobs, though I don't mean to take away from the police who are currently under severe stress, and that is next to enlisted military personnel. Even before the COVID-19 turned a world of emergency responders upside down over the last few months, behavioral health and wellness was an increasing area of focus in the emergency response community. We had seen increases in anxiety, depression, PTSD, 
suicidal thoughts and behaviors, substance abuse disorders, and similar issues. In 2019, a survey of first responders, including police, fire rescue, and public safety communications, found that almost 8% of approximately 5,000 respondents had thought recently about committing suicide, double the percentage found in the general population. That's important to recognize. Suicidal thoughts were clearly linked with conditions that included depression, trauma reactions, flashbacks, nightmares, and avoiding reminders of a traumatic experience. Depression seemed most common among respondents with greater than five years on the job. One third did not seek help because they wanted to handle their distress on their own. Another third feared the stigma of mental illness or negative job consequences if their employer found out. As we know, this can be a pretty rough profession. This survey was not only studied to show the psychological impacts of serving on personnel. Numerous studies have documented the adverse effects going back to at least 1986. Each pointed to the cumulative behavioral changes brought on by repeated exposure to severe stressors. The current pandemic has added an additional layer of stressors on top of that issues and that have existed all along. A recent news report by CNN provides an excellent shot, a short view of what we are now facing. In 15 years with the Fairfax County Fire Department in Northern Virginia, there wasn't a lot that Captain Christopher Warner hadn't seen or couldn't cope with. But when he got the news in early April that he was positive for coronavirus, he says it was flat out unnerving. The potential that you could unknowingly come to work and spread this to your coworkers, to their, they could spread it to their household and you be the source, very uncomfortable. Across the United States, thousands of first responders like Warner have gotten sick with coronavirus, battled through it, and returned to the front lines. In New York City alone, where dozens of police and firefighters have died from coronavirus, more than 7,000 of them have returned to the job after recovering. But first, they have to deal with their own illness, go through isolation, battle their own fears, as New York paramedic Aline Reich did a few weeks ago. I have never been sicker in my whole entire life. I've never feared dying as much as I have now. Some come back fighting recurring coughs, weight loss, energy depletion. Before getting sick, Warner used to be able to run an eight and a half minute mile. Now, nowhere near the eight and a half minute mile and nowhere near being able to do the mile without being kind of fatigued. Many of them wonder if they really do have immunity, worry about infecting their relatives and colleagues, but still they battle. The work of saving people in this pandemic too important to them. D.C. Assistant Fire Chief John Donnelly recently watched two young firefighters who had just recovered go out on a COVID call. To watch them, you know, just go right back out like they hadn't missed the step. And I know inside they had to be worried about it. It was a little emotional for me to watch them go out and do the work. I was very proud of how they represented our department and our community. First responders tell us they bring new skills and sensibilities to the front lines after recovering. I was able to be more in touch with my patients who called because I knew exactly how they were feeling with a lot of it. And having gone through it, they're able to offer a knowing reassurance to patients. But many recovering first responders need their own reassurance. New York ER Dr. Lorna Breen, who had just recovered from coronavirus, took her own life recently. Donnelly worries about the emotional well-being of his recovering firefighters. To take this job and to do this job, you have to feel a little invincible. When things go wrong, your mind says, I'm having problems with this, that those are chinks in the armor that can weaken the system. Donnelly and other first responders acknowledge that there are professional stigmas associated with uh, firefighters, ER doctors, and others who need help for anxiety and depression. Some of them actually are punished for seeking that help. Even before this pandemic, ER doctors were at higher risk for suicide. And advocates, advocates say that on average, before the pandemic, suicide killed more firefighters in the U.S. each year than actual fires. Thanks, Mike, for laying out the problem. And that CNN uh, news report was a really good overview of where we are today. I'd like to talk now about resilience, psychological resilience. 
Resilience has a range of definitions in the research, including the ability to bounce back or return to normal after adversity, recovering from or adjusting to crisis, challenge, and change, or a real-time skill for flexible thinking in the moment. And all of these definitions and variations on them are legitimate. The definition that we like to use for psychological resilience is the capacity of individuals to respond in healthy and productive ways when faced with setbacks, adversity, and trauma. We all have the capacity to be resilient and to learn skills that increase our resilience. And at the same time, depending on the environment and our relationship with others who are involved and the inner resources we bring to the circumstances at a given time, we can be resilient in one situation and not in another. Good point, Karen. If I may interject real briefly, mm -hmm. uh, I believe that there's, you know, it's important for us to realize there's no shame in sometimes needing assistance to deal with our vulnerabilities. After all, we expect the public to call us when they're having a problem. So we're all human as well. So we should, we should expect the same out of our own. We should be able to reach out and ask for help when the time comes, especially these days. Allowing ourselves to feel vulnerable with those who make us feel safe is difficult, but absolutely crucial to behavioral health and wellness. Thanks, Mike. Excellent point. Now, I'm going to talk about the three main ways that we can show resilience or lack of. The first way that we can show resilience is through approach behaviors as opposed to avoidant behaviors. Approach behaviors are those that address problems directly and constructively. They allow us to seek solutions, ask for help, use the resources at our disposal to address the problem at hand. Avoidant behaviors are those that help you, as it suggests, avoid, ignore, or get away from the problems that you need to face. Karen, you know it's important to recognize that not all avoidant behaviors are necessarily bad. I think this is particularly true when we engage in behaviors that allow us to disengage our conscious thoughts and work about something out through our subconscious. We do that frequently in our regular lives. Why shouldn't we do that in emergency services? However, when these behaviors keep us from facing our, our current issues, the things that are gnawing at us, they become problems in and of themselves. You know, overall, I can think of three occasions when avoidant behavior is appropriate. One, when there's feelings of imminent harm, that little voice in the back of your head that says I'm in a bad place. Two, providing opportunity for our subconscious to work out a problem, just like I just said. And then third, when you recognize that the situation is causing unproductive thought patterns. Thanks, Mike. And, and we will be talking a little bit about the unproductive thought patterns next. Uh, so it's a good segue. Another way that resilience manifests itself is through productive versus unproductive thought patterns. Productive ways of thinking can involve hope, optimism, thinking about solutions, recognizing that things could be worse, and being realistic and thorough about what's going on. Now, on the other hand, unproductive thought patterns are generally negatively focused and make us feel bad and out of control of the situation and hopeless. When we teach, when Mike and I teach a more comprehensive class on resilience skills, we go into some detail about the thinking traps that we can fall into when we're not being resilient. You know, Karen, I think from my years in the fire service, four decades at this point, that we are most prone, emergency service workers are most prone to all or nothing thoughts which tends to undervalue our successes in emergency response and also personalizing where we point the finger at ourselves when things go bad. We sometimes have too high expectations or our ability to intervene. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, that's, that's a good uh, little preview of the kinds of thinking traps that we can fall into when we're not paying attention. So there's now a third way I wanna talk about that we can express resilience, and that is through productive versus unproductive emotional responses. Now, I wanna make clear, it is perfectly normal and natural to express so-called negative emotions like sadness when someone dies, or anger when we see an injustice or when someone's rude to us. 
But the situations that tend to push our buttons will bring out strong and sometimes extreme negative responses in us that are out of proportion to the situation at hand. And they can have destructive effects on our health, on our relationships with others, and our ability to practice self-control. Productive emotions, I'd like to point out, don't necessarily have to be happy or positive, but rather emotions that prompt us to take constructive action or to take things in stride or not be overwhelmed or consumed by our negative thoughts and to respond with appropriate levels of both positive and negative emotions. Those are the ones that are productive. The good news is that resilience is not some magical lucky state that only a few people get to enjoy. Rather, resilience is a set of common, ordinary skills and processes that help us in adapting to hardships. Practicing these skills and processes helps to, to develop and to amplify the protective factors that are associated with resilient thinking and behaviors. In other words, resilience is teachable and it's learnable. Resilient skills have been taught in education scenarios with both young and older children, in the corporate world, with high performance athletes, and in the military to soldiers and officers. Karen, let me point out that the skills and processes you speak of, the practical things, are no different than, excuse me, the psychological things, are no different than the practical skills we learn in recruit school or EMT. Basically, when confronted with X scenario actions, A, B, and C are appropriate. The psychological skills you were talking about, after practice, these should be almost on the level of muscle memory. Once learned, they are not conscious efforts, but ingrained reactions. We do that when we practice our regular skills in emergency response. There's no reason why we can't do the same with our psychological skills. Yeah, Mike, that's a great point. Um, the practicing of resilient skills is really key to being able to master them and to call them up when we need them in real time. Now, in studies done with the military, there have been really good results from teaching resilient skills in high stress, high performance environments that are similar to what you're facing. The US Army's Master Resilience Training or MRT program provides training to non-commissioned officers who then pass the skills on to the soldiers in their units. Independent studies have found increases in soldier reported levels of resilience and psychological health, reduced diagnosis for mental health problems and lower rates of substance abuse. The U.S. Navy's training was delivered online weekly directly to recruits over the course of their nine-week recruit training. Trainees reported increased sense of belonging and camaraderie, lower stress levels, better problem solving, better coping, higher group cohesion and social support, and less relationship conflict. And significantly, the retention of Navy recruits improved. Now, if resilient skills training of emergency responders can show similar benefits, such as retention, especially in the volunteer community, then we will have a very powerful tool to add to the toolbox of behavioral health and wellness approaches. At this time, we don't have that data yet. It hasn't been collected. But as resilience training becomes more prevalent, we are going to be able to collect that data and conduct that research. Along with that, Karen, I think it's important for us to, to look at prevention activities in and of themselves. These are designed to bring about change and reduce risks, threats, and harms. And they can be divided into primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention activities. Prevention activities, primary prevention activities, stop a negative event or reaction before it occurs. They prevent exposure to hazards, change behaviors that can lead to negative events or to adverse reactions, and increase resistance to negative outcomes if the exposure were to take place. The best example I can think of are stovetop safety elements that have thermal shutoffs. These prevent the cooktop uh, from getting to the point where it can ignite something on fire. 
Uh, instead, you're, you basically can boil water and that's about it. You don't have to worry about uh, setting on fire the napkin you left next to the burner. So secondary prevention. That reduces, these reduce the impact of negative events that have already occurred. They stop or slow the progression of an adverse reaction, prevent long-term problems, and return individuals to the status before the event. In this case, think of residential sprinklers, which are quick acting, or commercial cooking hood systems, which prevent the fire. Once it ignites, they immediately react and the fire is kept very small. Tertiary prevention takes place after the negative event has already occurred and has produced lasting adverse reactions. Reduce or relieve long-term negative impacts of the reaction is the purpose. Think of uh, also, in the colloquial expression, damage control mode. This is basically emergency response. The problem has, has occurred, the damage has occurred, and now we're just trying to minimize it. Resilience skills training is introduced at the level of primary prevention. It is intended to supplement, not replace. That's an important point. Supplement, not replace the secondary and tertiary prevention approaches available. Think of a prevention in terms of a triangle, the most stable of geometric shapes. All three sides must be present for an effective program to work. Thank you, Mike. Uh, I really like that, uh, that analogy of the triangle and the stability of it. Um, now I'm going to launch into uh, what research has identified as three main pillars of resilience in the emergency response community. And these represent the proactive factors that when, and the protective factors, I should say, that when they are developed, foster resilient thinking and behaviors. The first is flexible, optimistic, realistic, thorough thinking, or as we call it, fort thinking. The second is what we call coping capacity. And the third is social support. Now we're gonna go through each of these factors in turn. Okay. Karen, before we get into the details on fort thinking, I think it's important to understand that not, it's not about slapping a happy face on every situation. We're not here to practice happyology. We are here to discuss the downsides of extreme inauthentic optimism. Fort thinking is really all about realism and alternatives. True, Mike, and uh, I really appreciate you making that point. I'm going to uh, launch into what fort thinking is right now. It's definitely not happyology. Fort stands for flexible, optimistic, realistic, and thorough. We talk about building our fort to help protect us against adversity. The F is for flexible. Anytime we find ourselves reacting consistently in any particular style of thinking or way of explaining the things that happen in our world, we need to remind ourselves to be more flexible so that we don't fall into unproductive thinking patterns, patterns of feeling, patterns of acting that are unproductive. So the key question we need to ask ourselves to be flexible is, how can I think about this in a different way? The O in Fort is for optimistic. Optimistic thinking is one of the key drivers of resilient behavior. The ability to see the positive aspects of situations, benefits, and options enable us to move forward, find solutions, and have hope, as well as to feel a sense of control. And the key question we need to face here is, what is the silver lining? Now, not can I find one, but what is it? Because if you look, you will find one, no matter what the circumstances. R is for realistic. Optimistic thinking is not blind optimism. Uh, optimism. And extreme optimism can actually hurt us by blinding us to the realities of a situation. Realistic optimism lets you take negative events into account, but not be paralyzed by them. It lets you see opportunities and reasons to hope when the going gets tough. So the key question to ask for being realistic is what's really going on here? And finally, the T in Fort is for thorough. And this involves making sure that you haven't missed any of the details 
are thinking through the different ways you can interpret an event. When you see that an event can be interpreted in a variety of ways, you realize that you have a choice about which interpretation you choose. You don't necessarily have to go with the first interpretation that pops into your head. And the key question with thorough is, what other factors may have contributed to the situation? There's a reason that it is difficult to practice uh, fort thinking, and that's because we humans have a built-in negativity bias. Our brains are wired through evolution to look for and to be more affected by negative experiences, thoughts, interactions, and news, much more so than it is affected by equivalent positive experiences. We've evolved to be that way because we were more likely to survive by being aware of, avoiding, and escaping danger in an evolutionary point of view. So we'd like to now show you a very brief video about negativity bias. Let me explain the negativity bias. As humans, we love negativity. It sticks to us and we hold on to it unlike positivity, which we easily reject. Let's take, for example, a conversation that we've all had. Someone is giving us feedback and they're telling us, oh, you did such a good job at this one thing and you did an even better job at this other thing. And that one thing that you did, oh, that was super great. But you know, there's this one area where you're not so good and you might want to improve a little bit. When we walk away from this conversation, the only thing that we remember, the only thing that stands out to us is that one negative comment. Our brains naturally do this as a survival mechanism to make sure that we are aware of any potential dangers or something that could possibly harm us. But the problem with this is that we can become completely focused on only the negative. This is where we have the opportunity to be aware of the negative, but embrace the positive. All you have to do is switch your focus. Negativity bias causes stressful, painful, harmful experiences and emotions to make changes in our nervous system and to strengthen the neural pathways in our brain that reinforce the negative focus. Now this is in part because the stress hormone cortisol sensitizes our brain to negative stimuli. As a result, we expect and scan for the negative and when we find it, we overfocus on it and we overreact to it. That's good, Karen. But sometimes, you know, despite the term negativity bias, it's really a survival mechanism. So sometimes giving into our nature, natural negativity bias is a good thing that can help us do our jobs better or anticipate how we can prepare for adverse circumstances. Let's face it, this profession can be stressful and dangerous. That little voice in the back of your head that says you're not in the right place can help keep you healthy and functioning so long as it does not get so loud as to drown out everything else. That's a really good point, Mike. Thank you for uh, reinforcing the fact that our negativity bias can be helpful to us. The problem comes when we apply it in every situation. And so in order for psychological well-being to take place, it's super crucial for our own psychological well-being to be able to take that step back, especially during these tragic, scary, uncertain times, and work on overcoming that negativity bias. One way to do that is by cultivating realistic optimism. Now, realistic optimism requires you to take adversity into account, but it doesn't let you get paralyzed by negative events. It's solution-focused rather than blame-focused. It allows us to, if you will, embrace the suck, but it gives us permission to move past the suck and to see the silver lining in the, and the hope in even the bleakest of situations. Agreed, Karen, agreed. Here are some ideas from the research that, uh, about negativity, bias, and realistic optimism that are important so we can cultivate these. The first, 
accept the uncertainty of life and the difficulty of the moment while making a deliberate choice to notice and amplify whatever good you can find. That's the silver lining you were talking about. Choose to see the unavoidable suffering of others as an opportunity for growth experience, maybe perhaps in a spiritual way, or as a way to increase your empathy or compassion for others, or as a way to appreciate others who are working to alleviate pain. Those fellow emergency responders who are standing beside you in all this. Number two, act on things that can you can control and change for the better. If you can't act just yet, make goals and plans to take action. Your planning must identify the challenges and obstacles you will face on the way to reaching your goals and must consider how you will address those challenges before they arise. The things you can't change or control, let them go. They really probably don't matter. Fretting about them will just increase your anxiety. Three, practice some self-care to help you tap the optimism that is within you. We all have it. We just sometimes forget that. What those things are specifically depends on what gives you rest and energy. Build rejuvenating moments into every day. For example, take deliberate brief pauses throughout your day to identify things to appreciate and savor, however small. Carve out time for physical exercise, especially a type you that you enjoy. Meditate or sit quietly for once or twice a day, even if it's only for 10 minutes. Do what works for you, as long as it doesn't harm your health. For me, that's a couple hours once or twice a week on my motorcycle. These are times when I get to decompress and reboot. Fact is, you can't answer the phone when you're riding your bike. So, four, when your thoughts turn back to dark subjects, which they will, don't try to suppress them. Let them coexist with thoughts that are more hopeful, compassionate, forgiving, and charitable, even funny at times. Ask yourself what you love, enjoy, value, appreciate, admire, and hope for as a way into more optimistic thinking that does not deny the reality of the current situation. Yeah, Mike, if I might interject here, I know you, you, you want to uh, finish up with one last point, but along these lines, I think the practice of the three good things exercise is a really useful way to start thinking about more positive situations in our lives the three good things exercise is that at the end of each day, you either write in a journal or just sit and think about three good things that had happened that day and what you had to do with making those things happen. Now, they don't have to be big momentous things. They could, you know, for me, sometimes it's just that the sun came up today. And what, what did I have to do with that? I noticed it. Hey, Karen? Yeah. Okay. I was going to say amen to that. You know, at my, <laughs> at my age, just getting up once in the middle of the night is a, is a really good thing. So, uh, yeah, it makes it easy. I only have to think of two. So, um, may I? Please. All right. Uh, the last item I want to bring up is recognize that being happy is not the goal of resilience. So this is probably the most important point. People who pursue meaningful goals that are aligned with their values often express satisfaction only in hindsight. While you're doing meaningful work and serving others, you may feel downright miserable at times. This difficult time will pass, and when it does, you'll be able to look back and feel good about the role you helped playing in others getting through their worst time. After all, we are in the business of the worst day of people's lives. So it's not going to make you happy, but you can certainly feel fulfilled. Great point, Mike. And uh, we're going to be putting in a resource list that you can find on Pilot Light Resilience resource, pilotlightresilience.com, our website, uh, some uh, resources that uh, will talk about the points that Mike made. So I wanna move along now to the second pillar of resilience, which is coping capacity. Coping capacity relates to how we evaluate stressful events and call up the resources that are available to us, both personal and external, to manage and deal with those events. Researchers used to believe that the amount of stress was the defining factor that produced the negative effects. But the amount or intensity of stress or even the amount of control we have or think we have over our situation is not nearly as important as how we process and think about those events. 
More recent research provides evidence that our stress response is determined by our mindset about stress. Mindset refers to the beliefs, expectations, and thoughts that act as a filter for our experiences. We now want to show you a brief video of researcher Aliyah Crum from Standard University talking about the importance of mindset. The video is called The Science of How Mindset Transforms the Human Experience, and it is put on by the World Economic Forum. Our minds aren't passive observers, simply perceiving reality as it is. Our minds actually change reality. In other words, the reality that we will experience tomorrow is part a product of the mindsets we hold today. Our mindsets come from many places. Our mindsets about stress come from our upbringing and the words of encouragement we may or may not have heard. Our mindsets about what it means to be fit and beautiful are a product of the cultures that we live in. Every day, marketing and advertising shapes our mindsets about what is good, worthy, or exciting to eat. And influential doctors and health scientists have an uncanny authority to craft how healthy we expect ourselves to be. I study mindsets like these and how they impact our physical health. Thousands of clinical trials have shown that simply taking a sugar pill under the impression that it's a real medication can reduce not just our anxiety and pain, but lower our blood pressure, boost our immune system. Placebos work not just by making us say we feel better, but by triggering, activating a whole host of specific neurobiological effects. Holding the mindset that a pill or medication will relieve your anxiety, for example, activates the body's parasympathetic nervous system. The power, of course, is not in the sugar. The power comes from the social context that shape our mindsets in ways that activate our body's natural healing abilities. And the dirty secret of all clinical trials is that once the trial is said and done, the placebo effect remains, not as something to be subtracted or ignored, not as some magical or mysterious response to a sugar pill, but the psychological and social foundation, the support system on which the total effect of any drug or therapy is placed. These principles apply to health behaviors as well. Hotel room attendants, for example, get a substantial amount of physical activity throughout their day of work, but typically don't think of their work as good exercise. What we found in our research is that a simple shift in mindset, from the mindset that their work is just work, to the mindset that their work is good exercise, produces physiological changes in the body. After just four weeks of adopting the mindset that their work is good exercise, hotel room attendants lost weight and lowered their blood pressure by 10 points. What this means is that objective health benefits, things like a healthy heart and a healthy weight, depend not just on what we're doing, but what we think about what we do. The same is true for food. In this study, we gave people the exact same milkshake, but with two very different labels. What we found is that when people thought they were in the mindset that the shake was indulgent and caloric, their body's hunger hormone ghrelin dropped at a threefold rate speeding up their metabolism and leaving them feeling physiologically satiated. So how does this work? How do mindsets influence our health? Take these two mindsets about stress, for example. The truth is that both of these mindsets are possible, but the rub is that the mindsets we choose to hold influence the outcomes that will result. Mindsets change what we pay attention to. Mindsets change what we're motivated to do. Mindsets change how we feel and expect to feel. And mindsets change what our bodies are prepared to do. 
through cascading effects on these psychological, behavioral, and physiological mechanisms, mindsets can create the reality that's implied. In other words, having the mindset that stress is enhancing, ironically, is what makes those enhancing effects more likely. So as influential leaders and decision makers, it's essential to recognize that mindsets are not peripheral, but central to health and behavior. If we truly want to tackle the diseases and crises of our time, we need to more effectively acknowledge and leverage the power of mindset. Thank you. From Dr. Crum is really enlightening. You know, basically what it says is that you can choose to expect benefits from dealing with the stress of your job, or you can choose not to. You can choose to trust yourself to handle the challenges in life, or you can choose not to. Think about how this works out. Would you rather spend time with, who would you rather spend time with? Someone who is positive and upbeat, or somebody who has that continual woe is me attitude? It's pretty easy. Choose where you are. That's a great point, Mike. So now we thought it would be a good idea to talk about coping capacity in the context of a pandemic. And that led us to looking at ways to avoid job burnout. Just this past year, the World Health Organization named burnout an occupational syndo syndrome resulting from chronic workplace stress that has not been successfully managed. Signs of burnout include being easily frustrated or irritable, feeling sadness or depression, tiredness, exhaustion, and overwhelm, apathy or indifference, and a feeling of being disconnected from others. So what does stress management look like in a pandemic? It's about controlling what you can control. And because we can choose our mindset, we have the opportunity to avoid job burnout that plagues so many in the emergency response and caregiving professions. Here are some ideas that are supported by the research. One is to connect with reasons that you joined the emergency response community in the first place. The investment in training and getting good at what you do was not for nothing. Remember, you interact with people on their worst days. So helping others when they're most in need actually buffers against burnout. Studies show that emergency responders who have a sense of the good that they are doing in the world have, a higher, have higher levels of positive emotion and satisfaction with life at the end of the day. They focus less on the unpleasant aspects of the job and they feel more competent and valued. Here is a related research-based exercise that can help you feel a greater sense of control over your life which can help you avoid burnout. And it's called Live Your Personal Values. Your character strengths are those personal values that you express most naturally. To find out what your top character strengths are, you can take the free character strength survey from the VIA Institute on Character, or simply review the list of 24 VIA character strengths. The Pilot Light Resilience Resources website pilotlightresilience.com has links to these resources also. From the list of top character strengths, you choose a value that you express in your life. Now you get out your pen and paper or your computer and you write or type for 10 minutes about why and how you express that particular character, strength, or value and how it makes you feel to express it. The 10 minutes has significance in the research, so don't skimp on the time. If you'd like, you can pause the video to do the exercise and come back to us after you're done. But we're gonna go ahead. Okay. Karen, I'd like to point out again, uh, you know, my key values, love of learning is one of them, obviously, that uh, my progression through my education demonstrates that. It comes from a desire to understand all sides of an issue. The more I know about something, the more open-minded I can be. It helps me dispel those preconceptions that we all have. It leads to the other values I try to live, honesty and integrity. And certainly, given the length of time that I went to school, perseverance is one of the other things I value most. Uh, don't give up. There's always, there's always uh, another, you know, more, 
grass is greener on the other side. Keep going. Don't stop. Thanks, Mike. So this exercise, Live Your Personal Values, works to build resilience and prevent burnout because it helps you to understand the factors that give meaning to your life. When you can connect stressful situations with your ability to express values of personal importance, you'll be able to cope better with the stress in your life. The third pillar of resilience in the emergency response community is social support. Social support might require the least explanation or definition, but what we're talking about is uh, having people in our lives that give us a sense of relatedness, of belonging, and the knowledge that help is available if we need it. This could include friends, family, squads, units, coworkers, peers, teams, especially supervisors. All of them can play a big role in our ability, ability to cope with adversity. Interestingly, studies show that just knowing the support is there if you need it, which is called perceived social support, has a greater effect on well-being and resilience than if a person had actually sought out and received that support. So we need to have people in our lives who give us that sense of psychological safety, a feeling that they've got our back, and who really care about our well-being. Karen, in, in the emergency services, the culture that we are, we are faced with, which does not change easily, is a double-edged sword, I think it's uh, the best uh, analogy, like your slideshows. You know, after all, our colleagues in the fire department and the emergency services can be our biggest supporters with incredible camaraderie and trust that comes from working closely together in high-risk situations, sharing meals, training, we're all side by side. As a matter of fact, we probably spend more time with our comrades than we do with our families. So we develop strong emotional ties to them. We frequently see evidence of shifts, stations, and sometimes whole departments coming together to help a member through life struggles, mowing grass, preparing meals, visiting sick ones, all those things that go there to help support us through. But at the same time, the fired EMS culture, the pull yourself up by the bootstraps in response to adversity, suggests that psychological distress is a sign of weakness and discourages those who are suffering from it from reaching out and seeking support. In retrospect, and looking at it from my perspective at least, I guess, it seems that when the, the problem is internal to the member, let's call that perceived fault placement, treatment can be harsh or callous. However, when the problem is external to the member, that is to say the member is faultless, everyone pitches in. We also tend to want to protect our loved ones, those who are our, our teammates, the ones we never say that we love, and we often don't share the graphic details of our responses with the, the folks at home. So we end up not talking to anybody about it. If we share anything, we share the gruesome war stories with those with similar experiences. In essence, we're talking into the echo chamber. This does not necessarily provide for alternative points of view or sympathetic responses. All we get back are the reflections of the source of our stress and not appropriate means of dealing with that stress. Thanks, Mike. Very true. And during this time of pandemic, there are more challenges related to isolation and loneliness than there may otherwise be, as well as reluctance to talk about your own fears and concerns with those you're closest to. Here are some ways that you can cultivate the social support you need during the pandemic, as well as after life returns to its more normal rhythms. One way is to use the peer support and behavioral health resources that are available to you through your department. Now, this may sound obvious, but if they are available and you need them and you're not using them, you're not only hurting yourself, but you're also hurting your colleagues, your family, and others who count on you to be your best self. Karen, you know, mm -hmm. that brings up a good point. Not every department has a formal peer support program. If you don't, you should consider trying to develop one. It requires some resources and it may be more than certain departments have, but that doesn't mean it can't be a regional effort. I know of several in the country that are already going that route simply because of resource scarcity. So try to get one together. It actually will help and it's really not as challenging as it may seem. Thanks, Mike. 
Another idea is to set up a buddy system with a trusted colleague or team. And this can be done either formally or informally. Buddy systems are modeled after the Battle Buddy Program of the US Army and can be a very effective way for two or more people to be accountable to each other, to monitor each other, and to provide ongoing encouragement and support on matters of safety and psychological health. We have included a link to buddy system guidelines put out by NIOSH in the resource list that goes with this presentation. A third way to develop social support. When people offer support to you, and that support is offered willingly and without judgment, and you trust them, let them in. You may not be used to being the one to accept help because you're the helper. It may feel uncomfortable to accept that help, but letting others provide help is actually a gift from you to them because it makes them feel needed and gives meaning to their life. And as researcher Brene Brown has found, we can't grow without allowing ourselves to feel vulnerable. Now, your family and friends may not be the best sounding boards for your fears and anxieties, but maybe they can provide a welcome mental break during this time. So plan your downtime by connecting with loved ones and keeping and doing things with them either online or in person that you enjoy. Now we want to talk about a research-based skill that you can use to develop stronger connections with partners, family, friends, and colleagues. It's called active constructive responding. To demonstrate this skill, we're going to show you a video by Happier TV featuring professor and positive psychology researcher Tal Ben-Shahar. I suspect that if your partner came home from work and told you about a difficult experience, you would be there for him or her. You would listen, support, help, but would you also be there when things go well? When your partner opens up about something good that happened to them? Well, it turns out that how we respond to positive disclosures when others share their accomplishments or good fortune is actually a better predictor of the long-term success of a relationship than how we respond to negative disclosures. According to psychologist Shelley Gable, we can classify our responses to positive disclosures based on two dimensions. The first is the constructive-destructive dimension. A constructive response is encouraging and may include a few positive suggestions. A destructive response is discouraging and perhaps even demeaning. The second dimension of responding is the active-passive dimension. Active responding shows interest and engagement. Passive responding is detached and indifferent. If we evaluate a response along the two dimensions, the constructive-destructive dimension and the active-passive dimension, we get four distinct types of possible responses. Active-destructive, Active constructive, passive destructive, and passive constructive. Let's illustrate these four different types of responses using the example of someone who comes home and announces to her partner that she has just received the promotion she has been working towards for years. An active destructive way to respond puts a damper on the other person's excitement. For instance, one might say, now you'll uh, be even busier. It will cause more strain on our relationship. A passive destructive response displays indifference. This could involve uh, not making eye contact, uh, seemingly ignoring what was just said, or changing the subject. A passive constructive response involves little enthusiasm or interest. It might take the form of an acknowledging smile or a nod followed by a quick change of subject. An active constructive response ACR in short, involves enthusiasm, follow-up questions. Tell me more, so, so what happened? Uh, how did your boss break the news to you? Uh, let's go celebrate. It's about showing genuine interest. I'm so happy for you, I'm so proud of you. Partners who respond in an active and constructive way 
are much more likely to enjoy passionate, thriving relationships. Moreover, the relationship becomes more resilient and partners are better able to weather difficult times together. ACR can also help in professional associations, in relationships between parents and their children, as well as among friends. Think back to a situation where you responded in an active and constructive way. Think of a person you know who has responded to you in such a way. How did it make you feel? Can you learn from that person? What might you do differently in the future when you respond to positive disclosures? To help you make active, constructive responding a habit, you have to remind yourself to do it. You might wear a bracelet or put a note on your desk or write a daily recurring message in your scheduler about ACR. Active, constructive responding involves more than just approving of the idea. It calls for real engagement and involvement that keeps the excitement going. The response, of course, has to be genuine. Otherwise, it will not benefit the relationship. This doesn't mean that we have to be excited about the news to the same degree as the person sharing it. It's about acknowledging the other person's excitement and taking part in it. Karen, we have covered a lot of material in this pre-presentation, but the big question is, now what do we do with it? From a practical standpoint, the three pillars of resilience offer the best immediate application. First, let's talk about forward thinking. While forward thinking des describes and lays out the process sequentially, all four actions really occur concurrently. It is axiomatic that no two emergency situations are exactly alike. Similar perhaps, but not quite the same. This instructs us as emergency responders to approach every event, each event, with an open mind. In other words, be flexible in your assessment. Ask yourself questions such as, what is really happening here? What's the root cause? How can I get to fixing this? Is it going to be as easy as it looks or is it going to be more difficult? Also realize that no matter how bad the situation appears, your mere presence and intervention in the stream of events lessens the extent of harm. It follows then that any actions you take within the scope of your training and experience will only serve to improve the outcome. Recognize that as this exists, you have control unless you choose, choose to give it away. Be realis realistic in your assessment. While you may be in control, there are some aspects of the event that you may not want, may not be able to change. Accept the situation for what it is and not for what you would like it to be. Remember that you did not cause the situation. You were there to make things better. Make sure your assessment is complete. Emergency events often dictate decision-making with a minimal amount of information, but does not prevent you from gathering everything you can and being open to additional information as it makes itself available. Plug this information into your ongoing assessment. It feeds back into seeing alternatives increases your opportunity to further improve the situation and reach realistic, positive outcomes. The second pillar, coping capacity, also provides us with some near future implementation opportunities. To begin, try changing your mindset. Our approach to life situations is really a series of habits. And if it's a habit, it can be established or changed through conscious effort. Maybe not today, not tomorrow, but certainly over time. Recognize and accept that you did not get to your position because you're a schlub. You're a highly trained and proficient emergency responder. Again, you did not cause the situation you are trained to intervene appropriately. Recognize also that you cannot turn back the clock. You cannot return, return things to the way they were before the event, but you are having a positive impact on the return to a new state of normal simply by your mere presence. This new state of normal will be one that would be better than had you not been present at all. Finally, the third pillar, social support. Of the three, this may be the easiest to implement quickly. In emergency services, we tend to be very insular. Break that mold. Expand your circle of friends and acquaintances. Find something that interests you outside of emergency services. I found that my hobbies of motorcycle riding, backpacking, and woodworking, as well as my length of time in the educational environment, opened other worlds to me. 
I had other people to talk to who offered different perspectives and conversations. It helped keep me grounded and from becoming a victim of the echo chamber. I think it was well worth that. Thanks, Mike. This is all excellent advice. And I would add that resilience in practice rarely looks neat and tidy. In fact, it usually looks downright messy. And that's okay because the goal is sometimes just getting from moment to moment and day to day. I live in the Maryland suburbs of Washington, D.C., and my baseball team is the Washington Nationals, which I am very sad I don't get to see them play these days. In the lead up to their World Series win last year, when they were coming back from their worst record in baseball in late May, they started repeating the mantra, go 1-0 and each day. Don't worry about tomorrow yet. If you lose today, just pick yourself up and focus on going 1-0 and tomorrow. And that is resilience. So take each day that you get by as a win and move on. Learn to show self-compassion and forgive yourself if you're feeling that you haven't been resilient in a given situation. Resilience is a lifelong process. It's not a one and done effort. It takes practice. And just like any set of skills, practice regularly will eventually give you the desired effect. So thanks for sticking with us here. This has been uh, just a brief taste of the kinds of skills and benefits that proactive resilience training can provide for you and your department. We wanna thank you again for your time and attention and for links to resilience resources we've mentioned in this presentation, please visit pilotlightresilience.com slash MFSA 2020. And please, if you have questions about resilience skills training and wanna learn more, send us an email. We look forward to hearing from you and hope to see you sometime soon. Mike? Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your time. And thank you, I greatly Mike. appreciate it. And thank you to Shelley Kent for being our technical support on this presentation.